Welcome back, <clears throat> year nines, to this, your, your second lesson on uh, the uh, new Anglo-Saxon and Norman unit. Today we're going to be looking at the power uh, and the in limitations of the English monarchy. So this is uh, essentially that what this is, is this is uh, as a lesson is um, could be broken down into two smaller, shorter, chunky lessons. Uh, so it is, it's a full 75 minute period. We've wanted to break it down into sort of 40 or 50, maybe 40, 40, 45 minutes, two 40, 45 minute periods. That'd be a great um, thing for you to do so. I will pause uh, the video at what is kind of a natural point. So um, today, as I said, we're looking at uh, how powerful the English monarchy was before William's invasion, before it, William invaded, um, and some of the limitations as well uh, that the English monarchy, monarchy had. So a couple of key words here. Uh, please take a moment to write these down, uh, write down the key words and their meanings. So an oath and shire Now an oath is like, it's a lot more than a promise. Yeah, you know, okay, yeah, you shouldn't really break promises, particularly if they're to your friends or your family, okay, or anybody, to be honest. But an oath is a particularly strong promise. It is the promise uh, normally has religious connections. So quite often it is something that um, you swear on a particularly uh, religious relic. OK, or something along those lines, sort of like the bones of a saint or something. OK, uh, but ultimately it, it is uh, something um, that you do um, a solemn vow or a promise, OK, an oath, um, normally done to somebody like a superior, like a king or somebody above you. Then we've got Shire Reeves. So if you think back to the when we looked at um, our last unit of the uh, American West. Um, that term sheriff you should be more than familiar with. Now, when the uh, Americans set up their legal system in the West, they pretty much borrowed it straight out of medieval England, yeah? They took it straight from um, how um, medieval England was run. So um, we've got a shire or a sheriff is the king's official. Um, so he managed the king's estates and more importantly, collected the king's tax. He was the king's man, uh, a very powerful and important person, um, the, the king's representative out in his kingdom. OK, um, and uh, often in charge of local courts and administering local law. So Shire Eve, uh, or if you say it quickly, you get sheriff. So the first activity I'd like you to have about doing is um, create a mind map using this information. This information is on the textbook as well, um, which hopefully you've got um, running alongside this piece of work. So create a mind map using this information, um, showing the role of the monarch, or all the various roles and important part um, of the mark. Uh, and then when you've done that, I want you to answer this question here. Who was more powerful the king or his people and why. Pause the video here, go away, come back when you're done. So what about Edward the Confessor? How powerful was he? Um, well, Anglo-Saxon kings, like most uh, leaders in medieval times, was a, um, a you know, a, Anglo-Saxon kings were military leaders first and foremostly. They were kings because they were uh, good leaders. They were able to lead um, men on the battlefield. That was one of the of the most primary important thing um, qualities of a uh, of a king at that time. You know, and a, and a good king was able to win wars and win battles. Okay, and would lead his armies literally from the front, okay, riding a horse with a sword, okay, a bad king 
could not do that. And if they did that, often they would lose. However, Edward was a different kind of king. You see, he never originally intended or wanted to be king. Um, he had loads of older brothers who were supposed to do, well, not loads, but he had older brothers who were supposed to be king before him. However, um, largely as a result of circumstance and misfortune, um, they didn't make it and he ended up becoming king. Um, he originally, Edward had wanted to be a priest. He was hoping to join the clergy and become a monk and was hoping to live his days working in a monastery, surrounding himself with books. So um, he, he wasn't very good on the battlefield. You know, that's where he got his name, Edward the Confessor, from. So um, ultimately, yeah, what actually happened in the end was he relied upon his earls. OK, especially Earl Godwin. We'll talk about who Godwin is a little bit later on. He replied he relied very much upon his earls to do his job for him. OK, um, he obviously made the ultimate decisions. But when it came to uh, the scrappy stuff, yeah, riding a, you know, riding a horse, carrying a sword. OK, his earls and their thanes as well. Uh, you know, they are their, you know, their their knight, what was essentially their knights or their their their, their crack troops, the best fighters. He relied upon them. So um if you were a king at that time, yeah, you people respected you by winning wars and more importantly, handing out wealth, handing out land to people who who uh, fought for you. Okay. Edward didn't, didn't do any of that, okay? So what we need to do is we need to think about, um, ultimately, where the power and the land lie, or lay, I should say, and, and, and ultimately how he did manage to run his kingdom. Got another key term here, please make sure you write that down. Have another quick read through this text, answer these questions and pause the video. So how did, um, how did Edward manage to run his country? If he wasn't um, the kind of king that liked to, um, uh, or was able to fight battles and wars, how did he manage to succeed it? Well, first and foremost, because he was a clever, intelligent, and well-educated man, um, let's say he was deliberately meant to be a monk, uh, that's what he was setting out to be. Uh, he was very well read. He knew the laws that had been made by the previous kings. He knew a lot about them and he knew about how to make fair and just laws. So he was very respected as a lawmaker. Um, and not surprisingly, although Anglo-Saxon society saw traditionally saw kings who were good on the battlefield as being powerful, they did also quite like kings who kept the peace. Because nobody wants to go to war, nobody wants to die. So um, any king that is able to uh, maintain the peace and more importantly, deal with quarrels between families uh, and men of power, anybody who's able to do that is very well respected. And he was very good at doing that. And because also he was very religious. Now, um, Anglo-Saxon England at that time was a Christian country um, and was deeply Christian, very, very religious. Everybody was Christian, everybody was religious, and uh, anybody who was uh, especially religious, like monks, like nuns, was respected, okay? Um, pious, good keyword there, actually. If you don't know what that means, that word pious, okay, go away, look it up, finding out. So anybody who, who particular, um, uh, was particularly religious. Now, Anglo-Saxon believes uh, got a Anglo-Saxon society believed that their kings um, kind of special links to God that they were anointed. Keyword there. Make sure you've got that written down. Anointed and representative of God on earth. And of course, um, Edward, being a, a trained monk, okay, was especially good at doing the religious bit. Okay. So question here for you, he, because he was not a military man, he did not plan on becoming king, but hoped to become a monk. Sorry, apologies for the spelling error there. How did he come over, overcome this issue? 
pause the video, have a go at answering that question. So, uh, chance for you to reflect and consider the learning that we've looked at so far today. Okay, got three questions here I'd like you to answer. Uh, have a read of those, pause the video and answer the questions. So, chance to evaluate the role of the king, okay? So there's a question up here. What was the role of the king? What was the most significant role of the monarch in 1066? There are, I'd like you to uh, answer this question. There are some sentence starters here on the left, which could help you answer this question. And here are some points that you could discuss or you could raise. Pause the video here and have a go answering that question. So, uh, in the book, we might have seen source A, a sworn oath, okay? Very briefly, um, if you can't remember, uh, have a go at refreshing your mind, your memory about what an oath is. So this is an oath sworn by 12 year old boys, okay? All shall swear in the name of Lord, that is God, on every holy thing that is holy, that they will be faithful to the king. From the day which this oath shall be taken, the utmost loyalty must be shown to the crown on pain of death. Yeah, meaning you break this oath, your oath of loyalty to the crown, and the king may have you executed. The oath cannot be broken, and the breach of it means crimes against the crown, i.e. treason. So two questions I'd like you to answer down here. What does the source tell you? and what you can learn from the source. Couple of sentence starters here, okay? Pause, um, so this is the kind of, would be the end of the first kind of half of the lesson. So if you wanted to uh, pause the video, go away, crack on with all of the, the questions and activities for this lesson, and then come back, you can do that, and then pick up the second half of the lesson. Part two of the lesson today. Welcome back. If you took a quick, quick uh, ex uh, work break, um, activities break. So to, in this session, we're going to be looking at the limits of the king, okay, and how the king was limited. So I want to first of all introduce to you something called the Dane law, right? So the Dane law boundary is here. <sighs> oh, sorry, apologies for the sneeze. Let's try that again. So the Dane law is here. Right. So this blue section here is the Dane law. Okay. Now, if we get rid of the wild parts of the untamed lands, so here, Scotland, and the wild parts of the land, which was, okay, um, Wales, and the wildest part of the land is the southwest, okay? So we scrap those, all right? This, this land here, that is England, okay? So you can see that more than half of England at that time was Danelaw, yeah? So uh, Wales wasn't a part of England because scary uh, blue people lived there. More scary blue people here, even scarier blue people up there. Yeah, nobody wants to fight, fight the Scots, okay? Uh, the Welsh, they were all blue and had dragons, okay? And down here in Cornwall, they have seagulls that steal your chips. So um, ultimately, this here, that is England, now, more, as you can see, more than half is Dane law, right? Now, unfortunately, uh, for the last 100 years, um, what this Dane law area was, was essentially Viking country. It's where the Vikings lived. The Anglo-Saxon kings had kicked the Vikings out uh, not, not very long ago, really. King Canute uh, kicked out, um, and Alfred had kicked out the Vikings out of England. 
okay and um and ultimately um what was left was the dane law now kind of the people who lived there were still kind of thought themselves vikings descendants of vikings descendants of danish vikings and still liked to have the de the viking um traditions and local laws and customs and stuff like that and this presented a particularly tricky administrative issue for Edward, okay? Yeah, um, you know, these people still think they're Vikings and still think at the end of the day that they should be ruled by Vikings who are over here somewhere, okay? And still had all their little local laws and customs. So quite, quite tricky business for, for Edward to have to deal with, okay? Um, so that's your Dane law. All right, we've got a couple of key terms here. Make sure you written the, write those down. Okay, Dane law and embassy before you move on. So, so the, the Godwins are also another particularly difficult thing for, for uh, Edwin to have to deal with. So the, Godlet, the Godwins, they were in charge of Wessex. Here we go. So let's have a quick look. This is Godwin country here. Wessex, that's your Godwins, okay. Now Wessex was the richest and the most powerful earldom in, uh, in the kingdom, okay, in England at that time, okay. They had lots of lovely land, great suitable for arable and agriculture. They also had a lot of mineral wealth. They had a lot of people living there. Um, and ultimately, what we find is, is as a result of that, the earls in charge of Wessex were the most powerful earls in the country. At this time, the Godwins, OK, they were in charge of the earldom. Now, because of that, um, because they were so powerful, although they wouldn't necessarily disobey the king outright as such or rebel against him, because they were so powerful and Edward wasn't really a, a military leader as such, he relied upon the Godwins to kind of do the dirty work he needed doing, to do all the, 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 the killing and all the battling and warring, okay? So, so they were very much relied upon to help him uh, run his country at the time, okay? But it also meant that they could persuade the king they were in a, in a power of authority more so than other people. OK, so um, they were able to put pressure on him, you know, into, into uh, running the country they wanted it run. Now, in 1050, this kind of like power struggle between the king and the Godwins kind of really came to a head. So the king had ordered Godwin, OK, to punish the people of Dover. So we've got the Dover down here. OK. and um, so what happened was, is that the people of Dover uh, had attacked um, a visiting embassy from Boulogne. So an embassy had come from France, Boulogne in France, okay, and an embassy were sort of a peaceful political group of people come to have discussions with the king. They attacked them and they killed them, okay. Don't know why, uh, that's just things, people did stuff like that back then. That was kind of like uh, the, the thing to do. Um, so he ordered the Godwins to attack the people of Dover, okay, and punish them. Godwin refused. As a result, Edward, with the help of Northumbria, okay, uh, and Mercia. So look, two really, really big earldoms here. So he got them to help him, okay, exile Godwin. Yeah, sending Godwin to exile. Normally, back then, that meant sending them off to somewhere like De uh, Denmark or France, okay? Or actually, usually Normandy. Normandy, a lot of people like, because at this stage, that there, was, there was a lot of Normans in England, okay, involved in helping running the country. So, you know, and a lot of people were, were related to Normans. That the Normans, yeah, all they were were just Vikings that had settled in France, okay? Uh, that's all they really were. They were descendants of Vikings in France. So there was a lot of family uh, relatives over there. Um, so often people went over there for their exile. Um, 
But in 1051, Godwin was like, right, that, that's it. I'm taking back my earldom. OK, so he came back with a fleet and an army and he basically pressured Edward uh, into giving him his earldom back. Otherwise, there would be a big fight to prevent war. Edward agreed. OK, so four questions for you. Pause the video here. Have a go answering those. So the next limit to the king's power was the Witan. Now, the Witan was a council and it was made up of the most important and powerful people in the country. It was made up of the key religious leaders, the most powerful archbishops, the earls and some of them the most powerful thanes. The Witan's primary job was to advise the king on how to run his country. Yeah, he was like, they were like the SLT. Yeah. If Edward the Confessor was Mr. Denial, okay, then the senior leadership team are or would be the Witan. Okay. They were pretty much they they ran the rest of the country. Okay. And were made up of the most important people in the land. In fact, actually, it's also worth a noting that, okay, when it came to deciding who would be king, the Witan voted amongst themselves which of the member of the Witan would be a new king when the old one dies. The concept of um, the uh, divine right of rule, okay, or hereditary uh, king um, kingship doesn't come in until William the Conqueror. Before William, yeah, the Witan decides who is going to be the king, all right? And normally the most powerful, okay, the most important and the best military leader becomes the next king, all right? So thinking then, who, which member of the Witan do you think reckons they're gonna be the next king when he dies, okay? Who is the most powerful member of the Witan, do you think? So um, now the king didn't have to necessarily follow the Witan's advice. He could do his own thing. But, you know, at the end of the day, when it comes to actually, like, say, for instance, he's going to invade a country. Yeah. All right. Who's he going to invade with? If the Witan says no. Yeah. The Witan. OK. They control all the troops in the country. Yeah, all the earls, all the troops report to the earls. So who, who is the king going to invade a country with? He needs their support in order for him to do anything. If he wants to raise taxes, it's ultimately going to be the earls and the thanes that are going to pay these taxes. If they don't want to pay them, then they won't agree to it. So he kind of needs the approval of the Witan to do anything in terms of running this country. OK. Couple of questions here for you to reflect on. Pause the video and answer these questions. So, what about the earls? We've mentioned the earls several times already. Who were they and how much power did they have? Now, um, essentially, before the unification of England, okay, before the Anglo Saxon kings had unified it into a single country. It was about four or five mini kingdoms, right? And then what happened was, is when the country was unified, those mini kingdoms became the earldoms, okay? So we've got here, yeah, Northumbria, Mercia, East Anglia, Wessex, and Kent, okay? So these are one, two, three, four, five, the five earldoms run by five earls, okay? So, they were incredibly powerful people, okay? Incredibly powerful. Um, they were, they, all, all the thanes and all their, their slaves and the people who worked the land reported to them. They had all the money, okay? And essentially in order for the king to be able to run his country, he needed the approval of the earls. He, they, you know, they were his, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, his SLT. With, without them, he couldn't do anything. And ultimately, if he 
annoyed them or made them angry enough, one of them could rebel against him and try and take the crown from him. Although, remember the oath of loyalty, okay, they don't want to, you know, and they're very religious, very pious people. So the last thing they wanted to do was incur the wrath of God, but they could if they wanted to, all right? They were responsible for collecting taxes, raising um, armies, overseeing justice and legal punishments. They had great military power, okay? Earls had uh, economic, legal, and military controls of their earls and the earldoms. The big earldoms formed enormous power basis for the earls. So they were incredibly powerful people. You know, they, and without, the, without them, the king couldn't run the country, okay? And he really needed their approval to do most of what his stuff. They had each earl, okay, had a professional elite bodyguard of professional trained soldiers whose job was literally just to kill. They were soldiers and that was their primary job. They were called house carls or house carls, actually, if you're going to pronounce it properly. Okay. All right. They were, and the king was their generals. These guys were the kind of like the knight, the knights or the or the officers, if you like. Okay. And very, very profound, powerful professional soldiers. Okay, brief activity. There we go. There's that key term. Make sure you get that written down. Okay, four questions for you to reflect upon. Pause the video here, answer the questions, then come back. So, now they sound pretty powerful, these people, the earls, don't they? Yeah, they sound really, really powerful. Um, but they did have limitations to their powers. So um, ultimately, a powerful military king, yeah, a king who ruled through military power, okay, could dominate the earls, all right? He, he, he could, yeah, I'm the better soldier, I'm the better leader, you do as you're told, I'm in charge here, I'm the king. But of course, ultimately, as we've already encountered, that wasn't Edward, okay? He wasn't a military commander, all right? You know, he was uh, not a military leader. He was a thinking man. He was a lawyer. He was a religious man. He was a priest, okay? He had to use his mind to manage his country rather than his sword, okay? So um, ultimately, um, a powerful king, could demand obedience and punish those who failed him, but not Edward. In fact, Edward actually uh, started bringing Norm Normans into important uh, positions within the English government, and the Godwins didn't like that. Okay? They wanted the Normans to be kicked out and sent home. Okay, now the Earls themselves, obviously, uh, you might have noticed already, they although they were very powerful and had pretty much autocratic rule over their earldoms, they, they could only do so with the support of their thanes. Okay, all right. Um, and so without their thanes and their thanes with their huskals, yeah, you know, an earl was powerless. So they needed the support of their thanes, okay? Um, and if, if, a, uh, if an earl ultimately... Um, proved to be incompetent uh, or annoyed or upset his thanes, they could demand that an earl be removed from his position. So this happened in 1065 when Earl Tostig, the son of Godwin, lost his earldom and went into exile after protesting his thanes about the way he governed his earldom in Northumbria. This character here, Tostig, we're going to come across him a little bit later because he is a key part of William's invasion. Okay. So, so earls weren't all powerful as such. They, you know, the whole system, the whole hierarchy, yeah, was a tiered structure and everybody relied upon everybody else to get the management done. So time for you to reflect upon what we've looked at so far today. Uh, here's a question. What were the strengths and the limitations to the king's power? So draw up this table, a two columned table, okay? Um, Reflect back over the last couple of slides. What were the king's strengths? What were the limitations? Okay. And then, all right, 
Think about specifically Edward. How powerful was he in 1060? All right. Give reasons to support your arguments. Pause the video here, come back when you're ready. Okay, we've got a brief exam style practice question for you. Okay, all right. Describe two features of the Anglo Saxon monarchy that enabled him to protect England from foreign invasion. So it's a four, four marks in total. Yep, so uh, let's give a highlighter up. Four marks here in purple. All right. Uh, so feature one, that's going to be two marks. And feature two is going to be two marks, total four. Okay, all right. Um, so thinking then specifically about uh, his, his features, all right. Um, there are some sentence starters over here to help you accomplish that, all right. And some top tips. Pause the video, have a go, come back. Right, so once you've done that, um, have a go, yeah, using this is the mark scheme here. All right, so have a go here um, at reflecting and marking your work. If you've got a friend or a family member or somebody to hand, you could ask them to mark it for you. Perhaps do a little Zoom chat with one of your friends uh, from school or uh, a parent or, or uh, an older brother or sister, or, or even, hell, even a younger brother or sister, stick it in front of your, uh, your, your, you know, your, your little brother or sister and see what they can make of it. But have a go at uh, marking this work yourself. All right. So when you've completed all of this, okay, this is ultimately, if, if you see what kind of a grade you're aiming for here, all right? And this is ultimately, if you, so if you're grade seven or if this is the kind of grade you're looking for, this is what you should be able to accomplish. Okay, if you're looking for five or six, you should be able to do this. If you're looking for, this is what you should be able to do. All right, thanks very much for listening in guys and girls. Uh, quite a lot of work for you to have to accomplish and complete with this one. Um, uh, enjoy, uh, and if you've got any questions or queries, by all means, uh, drop me an email, or if you've got anything you want me to have a look at, more than happy to, uh, to do that for you. Thank you, everybody.